Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, welcome to another AMA. How are you doing? Good, thanks for having me. Yeah, so today's AMA, we're really going to focus on metabolic health. So I think a lot of people are familiar with this term you call the four horsemen, which are the four major diseases of aging. That includes cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurogenitive disease, and then metabolic disease, which is really a range of conditions, kind of from obesity all the way to type 2 diabetes. And we haven't covered it on recent AMAs um, that closely. And so what we wanted to do was gather all the questions that have come in on that and then put them into today's AMA. So we're going to hopefully get to as many as we can, but this will include like what is metabolic disease and how do you define it, how it feeds the other three main horsemen and how it can cause problems for people. And then really look at the metrics that you look at with your patients to understand on an individual level where they're at metabolic wise. And so I think a lot of people will look at metabolic health from simple blood metrics such as HbA1c or things that they can get um, with a typical annual physical. But I know with you and your patients, you look at a lot of other things and we're going to get into those details today, which is, you know, what are those things? What do you like to see? And ultimately what can they tell people about their metabolic health? And then we'll end the AMA looking at kind of what are the lifestyle interventions that people can use to help improve their metabolic health. And this will look at nutrition, sleep, and exercise. So, we have a lot to get to. So with all that said, anything you want to add before we get started? Uh, no, I mean, I just think we're going to structure this discussion by, you know, probably spending a bit of time talking about the nuanced ways in which you could define or identify a person who's not metabolically healthy. Um, and, and and we'll we'll come up with a very high bar for that on what, you know, real metabolic health looks like. Um, and then, as you said, we'll we'll talk about, okay, what do you do about it if you're in this situation? Because um, most people listening to this, uh, myself included, frankly, will always have an, an area uh, in which they could improve. Let's start with a little bit of a primer on metabolic disease and how it can feed into the other three horsemen, which is cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurogenitive disease. So to do this, I think we need to kind of define metabolic disease or metabolic syndrome and there look at how that feeds those other diseases. I think a bit of historical context is 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 helpful here. There was a a very famous uh, r remarkable endocrinologist by the name of Jerry Reven. Uh, definitely one of the regrets I have is not having interviewed Jerry for the podcast before he passed away because I did know him and I'd met him several times. Um, and um, Jerry uh, was at Stanford for most of his career in the 1980s. Made an observation, which was that where the following five um, signs went, so too did cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease. He identified these five signs, which we'll review in a second, and he referred to it as syndrome X. So he said, look, when people have truncal obesity, elevated triglycerides, depressed HDL cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, and elevated glucose levels, uh, this thing we're going to call syndrome X, and it seems to be a remarkable predictor of all of these chronic diseases of aging. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the entire history of this, but what changed was that that terminology became syndrome X. It referred, it became now metabolic syndrome, and and now we have some numbers that go with those things. So, um, you know, I, many people are probably familiar with these, but you know, we're now defining truncal obesity as a waist circumference of more than 40 inches in men, more than 35 inches in women. We're defining elevated triglycerides as over 150 milligrams per deciliter. We're defining low HDL cholesterol as below 40 milligrams per deciliter in men, below 50 in women. Um, we define elevated blood pressure as uh, above 130 over 85. Uh, or taking medication for high blood pressure over 120 over 80, and fasting glucose uh, is greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And the the syndrome is defined as having three or more of these. So um, I won't suggest that this is the best way to evaluate metabolic health. I think there are many more nuances that we're going to go into. But at a minimum, I think everybody should know where they stand on those things. And by the way, even though metabolic uh, syndrome is defined as having three or more of those, having one of those is still worse than having none. 
having two is worse than having one, et cetera. So in an ideal world, you wouldn't want to have any of these things. No, and I think that's good to kind of set that baseline there. And so the next question is then, how does metabolic syndrome kind of feed the other horsemen and those other diseases? We, we could spend the entirety of this AMA going through the literature on this. It's, uh, it's so voluminous and so uh, one-sided um, that I don't think it's particularly interesting. So I'll, I'll probably just touch on a couple of high points and we'll leave all the details in the show notes. Um, but if you look at all the meta-analyses of uh, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality, cancer incidence, uh, dementia incidents, all of these things all point in the same direction. Once you have metabolic syndrome, you're at an increased risk of everything. You're in, your, your risk of cardiovascular disease goes up by 135%. Your cardiovascular mortality goes up by 140%. Your all-cause mortality is up by 58%. Your MI risk, 99%. It's basically a doubling. Your stroke, 127%. When you look at cancer, it's a 56% increase in age-adjusted risk of cancer mortality if you have Metsin. In particular, there are a handful of cancers that seem especially impacted by this. So endometrial cancer, seven times as likely. Uh, esophageal cancer, almost five times as likely. Gastric cancer, twice as likely. Liver, kidney, twice as likely. So there are a handful of cancers that, that even appear to be especially exacerbated by metabolic syndrome or by obesity and overweight. And so, um, you know, I think most people understand that smoking is an enormous driver of risk for cancer. It is. It remains the number one environmental trigger of cancer, but obesity is number two. Um, and if you look more closely at the data, it's really metabolic syndrome, uh, which obviously overlaps a lot with obesity. If, if we turn our attention then to neurodegenerative diseases, and we'll start with Parkinson's disease, uh, the largest meta-analysis on this study suggests about a 24% higher risk of Parkinson's disease in those uh, with metabolic syndrome compared to those without. Um, it also appears to be graded. Uh, again, just as we see in atherosclerosis, um, we see that having you know three of the risk factors for metabolic syndrome is a 31% higher risk of uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, while having all five, a 66% increase in risk. When it comes to Alzheimer's disease, it's about a 10% increase in Alzheimer's disease uh, for those with Metsin. And what's interesting, at least in the uh, meta-analysis we, we looked at was, because uh, I, I thought that was actually a surprisingly low number. I thought that having metabolic syndrome only increasing Alzheimer's disease by 10% uh, struck me as, as low. But if you look more closely at the data, you'll realize that there actually appears to be a protective role in the abdominal obesity risk factor. So when you do the analysis by looking at uh, uh, each of the metrics of Metsin individually, um, be, there's about a 16% reduction in, um, in, in the ben quote unquote protective benefits of abdominal obesity. Now this is likely due to reverse causality. Um, so uh, meaning having met, having Alzheimer's disease is more likely to lead to abdominal obesity. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that's why those numbers don't look as big. Um, when you look at all forms of dementia, because remember Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent form of dementia, but there are many forms of dementia that are not Alzheimer's. There's vascular dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. So all, all, all comers, you know, vascular dementia uh, is about a 37% increase in risk. Yeah, so I think that's a really good and kind of quick overview of how metabolic syndrome can feed into the other diseases. And like you said, we'll have a lot more detail in the show notes because the reality is we just don't want to spend the entire AMA on that because I think at this point it, people kind of understand, okay, this is an important thing to care about and I should understand this for myself. And so the next section then starts to get to how do you identify beyond just the metabolic syndrome, what are some other metrics that someone can look at to know their kind of specific metabolic health? And one question that we get a lot, which is just starting at the basics, is how helpful is body weight and BMI to actually understand someone's metabolic health? It's such a crude tool. Uh, it's, it's, it's understandable why body weight and BMI are used as health indicators um, at the population level, you're 
you know, you're stuck with things that are very simple and reliable. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you hold up the figure from, um, I don't remember which chapter in, in Outlive it's from, but it's, uh, it's, it's from an, an, you know, an analysis that, um, I did to basically try to disentangle obesity and metabolic syndrome. So if you, if you take a look at that figure, um, and by the way, these, these are data that came from, you know, the NIH. Um, and, um, I think these turn out to be kind of conservative numbers, but, you know, conservatively speaking, you have at the time of this analysis, 2021, 108 million obese people in the United States. These are adults and 150 million non-obese. So, uh, obese being defined as a BMI over 30. Um, now, if you look at the people who are obese and have metabolic syndrome, it's 62% of the obese have metabolic syndrome. So that's 67 million people uh, are obese with metabolic syndrome. Uh, conversely, if you look at the 150 million people who are not obese, 22% uh, of those people have metabolic syndrome for uh, 33 million. Uh, and so what you can see is that you've got 100 million people uh, and again, I think that's a very conservative estimate. Other others have come up with numbers as high as 125 million, but call it 100 million people with metabolic syndrome in the U.S. But what I think is most interesting is a third of them are not obese. And so, you know, if you think about all the things that we look at in our patients and all of the metrics we have on them, I can just tell you, I don't know the BMI of one of my patients and I don't care. Um, because I'm not trying to practice medicine on a population basis. So, um, you know, I don't even know my BMI. I know, I know I'm overweight by BMI, but I, you know, I, it's not something that we're going to manage. So look, I mean, ultimately BMI just, it's not that helpful, right? It doesn't account for body composition. It doesn't account for, uh, insulin sensitivity in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, so, so we just, we just don't rely on it at all. We will do DEXA scans. We'll, we'll get into those details, but we don't care about BMI. It's a good intro to this next section, which is what are those metrics that you use with your patients to understand their metabolic health at an individual level? And so I think what might be helpful for people is if you just kind of run through what those are and then what we'll do after is we'll double click on each of them. Some of them going into more detail than others, depending on past content, but I think it'd just be kind of helpful for people just to hear that full list quick. Yeah. I mean, we kind of organize them as um, you know, functional tests, imaging tests, you know, typical or regular biomarkers, maybe some special tests. And, and then we'll even talk about things that are only done in research that we don't do, but would, you might see these things show up in, in papers that you're reading. So on the kind of regular slash traditional, you know, blood-based biomarkers, we, we look at uric acid, homocysteine, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, fasting glucose, insulin, hemoglobin, A1C, and, and liver function tests. Um, you know, I'd say one of the less common things that we do look at is uh, resting and fasting lactate levels, um, and obviously lactate performance in response to exercise. Um, so that's also kind of a functional test. Uh, when it comes to the functional stuff, though, we're looking at zone two output. Uh, we look at CPAT testing. So uh, effectively, the the you know oxygen utilization, CO two production under stress, oral glucose tolerance tests. Again, I don't put that down as a traditional blood-based biomarker because I think of that as really a functional test, although of course it relies on these biomarkers. Continuous glucose monitoring uh, and then whole body respiratory suites. We personally don't do that in our practice. Uh, we do all the others, but we don't do the whole body respiratory stuff. But you can do that to, to obviously uh, get a sense of respiratory quotient. Imaging studies can be really valuable here. So DEXA scans, which are measuring visceral adipose tissue um, and also measuring muscle mass body fat, which is certainly more relevant than body weight or BMI. Um, we certainly would never rely on CT scans um, for, for looking at visceral fat, although one could do it. And you do get it with MRI if you have the right software. Uh, liver ultrasound, uh, along with algorithms that combine liver ultrasound with blood tests to, to look at fibrosis scores, become very important as you want to understand the prevalence of fatty liver disease. And though we don't do this, uh, you, you might see this kind of stuff in in research studies, and it's 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 very interesting stuff. So you could you could look at um, uh, C sixteen saturated fatty acids. Um, this gives you a sense of uh, fat metabolism, and of course intramuscular biopsies 
will give you a great sense of how much fat is being stored in a muscle. And that can be obviously relevant for uh, insulin resistance. And it's obviously mechanistically important as well as we discussed in the Jerry Shulman podcast. Again, those aren't things that we're doing in clinical practice. I think it's really helpful for people just to kind of hear that whole list. And now we'll jump into kind of each of those into a little more detail, some more than others. And we'll kind of look at what trends you're looking for, what are the ranges you like to see, and then ultimately it will lead to the second section of this, which is how do you improve those various metrics. So why don't we start with some of the more regular or traditional biomarker tests that most people will probably get at any type of physical screening annual exam they go to. Can you kind of walk through what those are and what metrics you're hoping to see within your patients? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a premium member. It's extremely important to me to provide all of this content without relying on paid ads. To do this, our work is made entirely possible by our members. And in return, we offer exclusive member-only content and benefits above and beyond what is available for free. So if you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level, it's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Premium membership includes several benefits. First, comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing that we discuss in each episode. And the word on the street is, nobody's show notes rival ours. Second, monthly Ask Me Anything or AMA episodes. These episodes are comprised of detailed responses to subscriber questions, typically focused on a single topic and are designed to offer a great deal of clarity and detail on topics of special interest to our members. You'll also get access to the show notes for these episodes, of course. Third, delivery of our premium newsletter, which is put together by our dedicated team of research analysts. This newsletter covers a wide range of topics related to longevity and provides much more detail than our free weekly newsletter. Fourth, access to our private podcast feed that provides you with access to every episode, including AMAs, sans the spiel you're listening to now, and in your regular podcast feed. Fifth, the Qualies, an additional member-only podcast we put together that serves as a highlight reel featuring the best excerpts from previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and listen to each one of them. And finally, other benefits that are added along the way. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can also find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, all with the handle Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you use. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take all conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of all disclosures. Mm -hmm.